Uh, welcome to uh, this really terrific event. We are really, really fortunate to uh, have these two faculty speak about their experience teaching an honors seminar, which they've been teaching for 10 years. And it was one of the first courses to be offered by the honors program, well before I was involved with it. And it has um, really grown some roots here at the college. And as director of the honors program, my name is Tom Grady, by the way, um, I am most grateful to uh, these two faculty for not only teaching a terrific course that really transforms people's lives, which it does, but also that they've been bringing consistently um, extraordinary speakers to the college uh, that have generated a lot of interest and a lot of um, attendance. I mean, there was one where they had to bust open this whole area because he was so many people desired to hear him speak. So for that, I'm grateful. This is the only um, team talk course here at Bristol for the honors program in which the two faculty are in the classroom at all times with the honors students. It's a real privilege for them, I think, to have the um, show up uh, taught through two disciplines, history and English, essentially at the same time. I've also been really lucky to attend the final projects that students do at the end of the semester, which have been absolutely extraordinary because they really have to start from nothing and pursue a question that they don't know the answer to that somehow is related to the Holocaust and to their own personal interests or relationship to it. And they've been um, some of the most authentic scholarship I've seen at the college. The other thing is, I just want to mention that uh, their experience has culminated in uh, this terrific book, uh, which is just one of the most moving um, texts I've read by faculty, certainly by faculty here at the college. And I urge you all to purchase it and read it. If for only, you know, it is, it is a serious piece of scholarship about the teaching of this subject to students, especially at a community college. But I would. Uh, defend that the opening sections uh, written separately by Ron and Howard are some of the most moving, um, uh, revealing uh, testimonies to their lives and how it can't, they've come to a place to teach this course and it's changed them as men. And that to me is the most moving way of expressing yourself as a scholar is that it's so deeply rooted in your path as a person on this planet that it's some of the best best stuff I've read as a person myself. So without further ado, I'll shut up and I will hand this over to Drs. Ron Howard. Ron Howard. <laughs> Ron, we <laughs> Ron Weisberger and Howard Tinberg. Thank you. And here's a real test of our teaching collaborator. We're going to have to fight over this microphone, but that's, that's okay. You know, you remind me, Tom, when we were looking over the, the, uh, the galleys of this book and looked over that particular section, I know I remember thinking to myself, did I really write that? Uh, did I really reveal as much about uh, that myself as that? I did want to remind, let people know that there is a flyer, had been a flyer going around announcing another speaker coming to campus. Uh, Professor James E. Young will be coming to BCC on Thursday, March 6th. Um, He's a, a distinguished Judaic studies professor at UMass Amherst. And his, his specialty is really interesting. It's on memorializing the Shoah, the Holocaust. Um, in fact, he's been on jury groups. Uh, uh, I think he was on the jury group that, uh, that designated the winner of the 9-11 uh, memorial. Yeah. In fact, he's going to talk about the relationship between Shoah memorials and the 9-11 memorial. So if you need more information after, after please uh, come up, and uh, we'll be glad to give it to you. OK. Uh, Tom mentioned that, uh, that this book is very much about our teaching um, over 10 plus years now, and uh, we wanted to make the case that, if we want to make a case, I don't know if this is more or less sharing our experience of writing, and writing the book and teaching the course, that, uh, that the classroom is a really a significant uh, source of research. And we, we both have uh, talked a lot over the years uh, about class, the significance of classroom research, especially at, at a teaching center institution such as BCC in Bristol. Um, so we thought we'd just lay the foundation first about uh, how we came to this notion that, that's, that the scholarship of teaching itself uh, is a legitimate form of scholarship in the academy. I know Ron's going to say a few things about this. I am? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we haven't rehearsed this uh, 
entirely. Um, yeah, if you can see from the couple slides that we have, um, early on, uh, I'm the historian, you know, so everything's in perspective here. <laughs> in 1990, um, well, actually earlier than that, in the, in the 80s, um, Ernest Boyer, who was the president of the Carnegie uh, Foundation, um, raised the question about whether scholarship, whether teaching should be a, a, a way of doing research. You know, as we know, in the academy, especially in uh, uh, baccalaureate or graduate universities, everybody has their own specialties and research is required. But teaching, which should be the foundation of what everybody does, wasn't seen as being a, a place where you do research. Uh, at least it wasn't given a lot of credibility. Anyway, he raised the issue from his pre prestigious perch there at Carnegie, and that sort of gave rise to a, a movement uh, that's still going on um, in which, uh, in 1990, uh, after some discussion over that decade, actually he did that around the early 80s, uh, this other document called the uh, uh, Scholarship Reconsidered lay out some priorities for the professor writ professorate uh, as far as uh, the kind of research that could be done using the classroom as a, uh, a place of uh, research. So you can, you can see it laid out here um, in these four uh, bullets. Uh, but again, the main emphasis was on that we can learn from our own teaching. So, so much of, you know, one teaches and then it goes away and now it's the next class. Right, and then it goes away into the ether. And we may reflect on it, but you know, already we're thinking of the next class. But doing research where you can really look carefully using you know, the same type of criteria as you do in any research helps us capture <clears throat> what we may have learned and what we need to learn in order to go forward uh, and become the best uh, instructors that we can be and also pass on that research to colleagues and others. So anyway, that's what came out of that. Uh, and then um, the next book that came out, 1997, has to do with scholarship assessed, which laid out some, uh, what's, yeah, what are the uh, criteria here? Again, sort of reiterating preparation, appropriate methods, results, presentation, and critique. You know, again. Uh, I, sh I yeah. should say, that's, I did this. <laughs> we weren't quite at stake, sorry about that. Uh, but what I was going to add was that the scholarship for teaching, uh, eventually, those who, who, who uh, promote the scholarship for teaching felt that it was really important to embed the scholarship in the, in the, in the discipline itself, whatever discipline we're talking about, English and history. Um, and, and that as teachers, we'd be fully aware of the kind of methods that we use and be very explicit about what it means to uh, critique a poem, what it means to, uh, to study history, uh, and if possible, if possible, break through some of those disciplinary barriers as well. In other words, try to see if we can see what, what overlaps between uh, English and history. And as a result, I think our students would benefit from that, that conversation. Too often students kind of go from one class to another, and there doesn't seem to be a kind of connection between one course and another. Uh, I think this, this particular uh, classroom experience, where both teachers are in the classroom, each representing a different discipline, allows students to begin to seek connections. But it begins with us. First of all, without getting along, talking to one another, uh, but also being willing to uh, uh, to kind of see uh, see the show in this case, the Holocaust, from uh, another disciplinary perspective right. than our own. So that that was sort of an advancement over, um, in a sense, as research <coughs> continues. You know, people keep thinking about rarifying and making it more. So going from the idea of research in general at the classroom and thinking about interdisciplinary uh, process was the next step, and then. In a sense, we had already started teaching the course prior to that in 2005, but in a sense, we took up that challenge, and that's really what our course is all about. So let's get to the course itself. Let's dig, dig uh, deeper a little bit. Um, and, and you see on the screen some brief history of, of the course, but I, I especially want you to pay attention to the artwork in the lower right-hand side. Um, it's a painting done by Samuel Bach, a Holocaust survivor himself. Um, and this particular work is called Shema Yisrael, which is a sacred prayer in, in Judaism. Uh, and for us, it's a very poignant uh, work um, on so many levels, but it, it points, for, for one thing, to the difficulty of piecing together the, the elements of the, of the Holocaust, which we will uh, call the Shoah for reasons that we've got to answer when we get to some discussion. Um, 
what you see in front of, uh, in that slide or in that particular graphic is uh, are, the, are the Hebrew letters that form the prayer of Shema Yisrael, which is essentially a, uh, an expression of a belief in one God. Um, and, and the letters are broken; they're scattered. Uh, so much of Bach's work is is of pieces, of fragments. Uh, it's not that he's trying to depress us; he's just trying to uh, show the immensity of the challenge to try to make coherent what seems uh, incon incoherent and incomprehensible, namely the, uh, the show itself. We also wanted to make note, uh, we won't go over all these, but uh, that we felt that as classroom researchers, there are certain questions that we, uh, that we ourselves wanted to find the answers to. Uh, and because the show is such a difficult and traumatic subject, because it so often, in some ways, forces all of us to Oh, compartmentalize, I guess. Compartmentalize our thinking processes from our emotional or affective processes. That we, we have a special burden as classroom instructors to try to integrate those perspectives and to, and to model it ourselves. Uh, to to, to uh, show students a way to balance the affective and the cognitive. Uh, in other words, uh, when students read a very difficult passage, and we'll be looking at something uh, shortly, uh, we want to make certain that they're able to find the appropriate distance to be able to ask thoughtful questions. But of course, we want them also to feel something for the subject, to not be cold or too distant from it. And that's been one of the challenges from the beginning. We have, we have many students reported to us that they've read, they've read a certain diary from, say, about the Warsaw Ghetto, and they, they just had to stop in the tracks. They couldn't continue because the, the details are too graphic, and, and, and it was just very difficult for them. Uh, that's a legitimate response. Uh, we hope, though, we hope, again, to, to model a slightly more complex, more nuanced response, which essentially move on, find that proper balance between distance and proximity, uh, and, and as a result, hopefully learn as much as possible uh, about uh, the Shoah as a result. The Shoah is such a complex subject, it seems to me uh, we need all hands aboard. <laughs> History, rhetoric, uh, literary criticism, and other, other fields as well. Psychology, we've mentioned in, in the past, or really cool would be to have someone from psych to help all of us uh, try to understand the kind of uh, psychological implications um, of, of this material. And of course, no matter how we assess this, this uh, when students uh, find that balance between the cognitive and the effective, or between an understanding of history and an understanding of, of English, uh, is an important part of the process of our research. Okay, let's get to the subject itself. Um, I th we thought we'd start with uh, a poem, one of our favorite poems, from a poet named Dan Pegas. The poem is called Draft of a Reparations Agreement. Uh, and this is just but a stanza. Everything will be returned to its place, paragraph after paragraph. The scream back into the throat, the gold teeth back to the gums. Here we go. <laughs> Here we go. Uh, I, I pres you know, we present this to you not to make you guys feel terrible, obviously, but to really make a point, many points, um, which is that this, the challenge of teaching this, this show on requires us to, as Elie Wiesel often tells us, to kind of stare horror in the face, as it were. But be mindful that though we study the Shoah and do our very best to find answers to the questions that are posed by this difficult subject, that we may very well not be able to put everything back in its place. That each of us is changed, is transformed by the experience of studying the Shoah. Um, and uh, indeed, we become witnesses, all of us, our students over the years, ourselves, witnesses to what happened uh, in the bloody, bloodiest half, or bloodiest part of the bloodiest century in the history of mankind. Uh, and so the challenges are enormous. You can stop me anytime you want. Right? <laughs> um, can I ask, are Shoah and the Holocaust interchangeable? Yeah, the, uh, saving up for the question, that's a good question, we should say to up front. Uh, Holocaust, which became, that term became common after World War II, and has to do with a bird sacrifice. And it didn't, at least to some folks, it didn't seem really appropriate, given you know, what occurred. So the Hebrew word Shoah means catastrophe. So we use that term, and it's used oftentimes instead of Holocaust, although Holocaust is still pretty much out there as well. Thank you for asking that question. So we, we thought we'd talk about uh, our need as instructors in this class to pay attention to different ways of knowing that each of us has been trained to exhibit both as someone trained in English, someone trained in, in history. And we begin, as, as we ought to, it seems to me, with students' words. In fact, one of the things we're really proud about in terms of the book is the importance of student voices in that book, drawing from student journals especially, uh, conversations in class. They're really at the heart 
of this book. So we have two students whose words we're quoting here. Um, I will just read them. This is from Sharon, February 2011. Something as big as this catastrophe doesn't just happen without some sort of history giving evidence of what was to come. And then Richard, whom we'll be hearing from later on, reading this passage from Ida Fink's short story, The Key Game, helped me to stop thinking about the show in broad strokes and to start paying attention to the fine details. Uh, we would argue that the, these students are at the very earliest stages in trying to articulate what it means to do work in, the, in our particular disciplines, that they've made a start. How have they made a start? I think you want to talk, I think, about Sharon's contribution to this. Yeah, well, again, you know, we, which we'll, I think we'll get into, um, we see, you know, history provides the context. It provides the, the, uh, you know, the chronological facts of the Shoah. It also provides the, uh, the context, and it also, we hope, gives some idea of causation, even though there's the answers are, there's no final answers, but there's a lot, there's many uh, historical works we, we use, We've used a number of different ones to try to provide students with an understanding, the backdrop. So that's what Sharon's trying to say. Something like this didn't just happen. Obviously, there was some precedent. You know, there was something that brought it on. What it was, you know, again, it's complicated, and we try to lay that out. But it didn't just appear out of nowhere uh, in 1939 or 40. So, so causation is really important in understanding the historical method, as is narrating the facts themselves. Uh, I think Richard's trying to get to something that uh, I think literature especially can provide uh, insight for, of, and that is how literature particularizes experience. I think one of the challenges among many of teaching the Shoah is to be stunned by the numbers, the 6 million or the 20 million. Uh, and I think, again, though we may be talking fiction, as we are here in, in Ida Fink's story, Yet, we get to know a particular family. We get to know something of what they felt while they were hiding, knowing full well that the next knock on the door would be the uh, Gestapo to take them away. Uh, he's also, I think, we talk about this in the book, beginning to understand something of how the short story works as a genre, understanding uh, how, the, how every short story writer, at least the very best, uh, makes certain that every word counts, every detail matters, the, the finer points, the small, uh, most. Sweat the small stuff. In other words, we didn't have to do that. These are all very, very important matters. And, you know, we one of the questions that does rise is: Can you, should you fictionalize the show? You know, can you do it? Uh, we, I think, hopefully through the readings, make the argument that you can do that. Uh, it has to be careful, uh, but uh, you can, it's important in terms of understanding it and its to its totality. Uh, Rather than to the fact that some survivors have objected to novelization fictionalization of the show, since there's so many deniers out there willing to pick up on any, any perceived loophole, any, uh, any inconsistency, uh, and survivors will often ask, well, don't make it up, you're just, you're just giving fuel to the fire here. Uh, artists have something to add to our understanding of the show, and we, we, we look at both works of uh, non-fiction and fiction. Indeed, we, work at, we look at works that blur the boundary between fiction and non-fiction in a very postmodern sense, Arts Bigelman's work uh, especially. So uh, we, we begin our, uh, or continue our discussion of, of the scholarship of teaching and learning as a, as a basis for a tool by which to understand how our students learn. Um, and I think it seems to me that an important component of social scholarship of teaching and learning is um, a direct, uh, seeing a problem as a point of learning. Uh, in other words, um, we don't want to shy away from problems. <laughs> we want to confront those problems. We want our students to confront those problems. Uh, and so you have on the screen a passage taken from Abraham Lowen's really poignant diary, The Great Deportation, the, the story of what happened in the last hectic, crazy days of the Warsaw Ghetto. The passage reads this way, the 14th day of the action is being continued at full speed. The Germans work together with the Jewish police. There are stories of terrible looting and violence during the expulsions. Shops are broken open and the goods carried out. In this participate Jewish police, ordinary Jewish neighbors, and Germans. At which point we'd say to ask our students, yeah, do you see any complications here? Or they would bring it up themselves. Uh, I don't know really want to do that right now. Or, uh, <laughs> um, uh, well, uh, obviously we can follow this up later on, but uh, obviously one of the, and this is what Lewin points out, that the notion that Jews would do this to Jews becomes incomprehensible. In class we talk about the remarkably 
difficult, complex task that the so-called Judenreich had to face. These are those Jewish councils that the Nazis entrusted to oversee its actions. Uh, they were trying to make certain that the ghettos could survive as long as they possibly could. But of course, they were serving uh, the masters as well. And they could not conceive. They could not conceive, and including even the Jewish police here, the, the, out, the end game, the extermination of hundreds of thousands of people. Uh, who could? Who could? It's only from hindsight we see the terrible atrocities that, uh, that, that occurred during the show. So this is the beginning. I think of that. This is when students begin to sort of look and wonder, what the heck? Uh, how could this be? Uh, again, I, I stress this point as a kind of pedagogical point. We should not shy as educators from, from having students engage with problematic texts. And a problem-based learning uh, is a key uh, a kind of initial point for, for genuine learning. You can't leave with the problem. You have to do the best you can to try to resolve those issues. Right. Um, and one, one of the ways that we uh, try to frame uh, this class um, is looking at the three cate categories, I guess, within this, uh, this narrative. And one is the perpetrators, of course, who committed it. And then uh, we see even that's complicated. We see the victims. Uh, and in some respects, that becomes even more complicated, uh, especially one of the books that we read called Neighbors. And then we have the bystanders, of which the majority of people are bystanders. <clears throat> and you know, what role do they play? Uh, we could ask ourselves even today, what role we play as bystanders when we think of Syria and other things going on. But in any case, what role do bystanders play during this? And so we want to give you two examples of bystanders. These are pretty uh, difficult things to hear, even though Howard and I have heard this many times, it's still pretty chilling, but we thought it's important. Again, the idea of problematizing, you know, uh, the Shoah. What role do bystanders play? Should they have done anything? So. This is an interview that comes out of the Yale archives. Uh, it's an interview with John S., uh, someone trained in the seminary. As you listen, Try to ask yourselves: uh, is, is there is, is there any disconnect here? Any complication? Now, my personal encounter was with the railroad station. Uh, they build a tall wooden fence there and the, the, nobody was permitted to approach the fence. The word was out that they had machine guns lined up alongside the fence and the street which paralleled the railroad tracks. But even then, you see, uh, I was not so much afraid of uh, the machine guns as, you know, my discipline, you know, I did not have permission to sneak up on the railroad station. I had permission to go and get something from the city, buy something. But I sneaked up uh, to the fence and I was in my castle. So I, I really stood out there because I looked left and right, but I didn't see, any, see anybody, even soldiers. So, and I found a hole there, it was a raw wood fence, and that was the day when I saw my train, my de deported train, and it just must have pulled into the station. That I see uh, very, with great clarity, no difficulty to of recall at all, colors, everything. It was a cattle train, and right in front of me, just about two tracks from the uh, fence uh, stood one of the wagons. I could see some more because the hole was large. And it was just opened. It was opened by an SS soldier. That I noticed. Those were already German soldiers. I didn't see Hungarians there. And it was, uh, the impression was terrible because it was terribly packed. I literally saw what uh, you see in pictures, uh, mothers with children and people and old people and little children and all. The impression was terrifying. It was really uh, packed. Uh, I mean, 
compressed and one man immediately jumped off and I always uh, remembered his face because he looked a little bit like my father and he must have been uh, something like mid-40s, closing on 50. I did not hear what he said to the German soldier, to that SS soldier, but his behavior was polite. He jumped off and my feeling was, my instinct or what I made up, that he was asking for water. And immediately that as a soldier, uh, with the club of his rifle, uh, clapped him down uh, and several times, I took insensitivity, uh, whether he died or uh, whether he was later put on the track. And then I ran away. I was so scared and I was so upset. I never saw anything like this in my life. I simply ran away. And, you know, this, I see it personally as the greatest tragedy of my life. That, you know, there uh, Jewish people were deported around me. I didn't do anything. I panicked. I, not even panic, not even fear. I just didn't know what to do. Now, my second direct experience was uh, the crying in the night. It was summertime uh, and uh, uh, it was one of those very, uh, very quiet nights uh, and uh, I could not sleep for some reason and there was enough moisture in the air. We were quite far from the railroad station but somehow there must have been enough moisture to carry sound and I woke up to a sound of Many people, my impression was literally thousands of people crying. I didn't know what it was first. Uh, it, was, it was a terrifying impression. Uh, and then I realized the, this is the sound of people crying. Uh, I, I remember even reflecting, you know, that uh, must be children, uh, women, men, everybody. Because it, it was that kind of a chorus, uh, wailing and crying. And next morning I uh, talked to the several other people who were still left in the, in the, the uh, our, in our Jesuit house and asked them if they heard something, uh, our housekeeper, our custodian, and they all said that they heard it. And I think it was the custodian, a gardener, a janitor, who told me that uh, those were the Jewish people crying because at our station uh, the Hungarian gendarmerie handed them over to the SS troops to be deported to Germany. And sometimes uh, when this happened uh, the people would start to cry and that would spread through the whole train and this is what we heard that night. I didn't know about the death camps as such at that time. And I didn't know about the ovens, the burning. Uh, uh, but I personally, at that moment, I felt a persuasion coming up on me that these people will be all killed. And again, you see, this is where I uh, stress what I'm trying to say. Uh, I wish I could uh, live my life. Today, maybe, I would be ready to then run in front of the train and lay down. And I don't want to sound dramatic. Uh, maybe I, I would have, uh, today I would uh, call out or uh, protest or risk uh, being shut down or clubbed down. And at that time, I was immobilized. It was just, you know, a feeling, uh, not what, even a feeling of what can I do, there is nothing to do. Uh, just running away, simply running away. It, it, was, it was beyond my experience. I was utterly unprepared. Decree was oops, passed or 
have all the juice come to a uh, I think you'll agree this is a complex testimony. Uh, if, we, if students are, you know, come to our, <laughs> if students come to our class uh, with a very narrow notion of what it meant to be a bystander, someone who simply was indifferent and sensitive and apathetic, I think when they listen and watch John S., they see something much more nuanced, much more complex. For me personally, I can't get over the death, the quote, uh, air quotes around death camps. Uh, that was so revealing to me. I don't, dis I don't uh, suspect or doubt the truthfulness of what he says, although this is from the vantage point of many years, but uh, we'd have to unpack exactly what we learn about what it means to be a bystander by looking at testimonies such as uh, John S's. There is no easy, easy, uh, neat definition. We're going to turn to one more complex yeah. testimony of bystander. Yeah, I just want to mention, here's where uh, you're talking about facts. He's Hungarian. The last Jews to be deported to the camps for Hungarians. This would have been in 1944, just uh, at the tail end of the war, and yet they continued to um, round up Jews and send them to the camps. Whether that makes any difference, whether it's 44 or 42, but somehow knowing that can make a difference in how you see it. Was he, was he clergy? I mean, he seemed to be clergy. He was in training at the time. Huh. At the time, right? And he referred to his discipline as one reason why he didn't uh, intervene. Yet he looked through the people. To the people. I thought the image was quite telling. Uh, now we'd like to introduce Regina, who was born in 1925, a Lithuanian. She's also uh, might be considered a bystander. Her story is quite different from John S's. Uh, 
Trojče je bolj, v žiti ni se rojo, v trku je, v drasti, v veži. Ti so rekel posmati? Jo, je per lango smeti, kjer je bil katka pagago, že no, ker to je, ker še dani se to lepki restoran, nas te bo pil, nas prekral, ta spu, ki še vsu surim, ta drabože, že no, vse veže, je v tja naj, ali kljaj ste v jažu s kazdari, si že no, ker bojo so. Tej, to zvarit ne bo prilike s restoranom? Jo. V ketvrti per langu so ta linja fabu še kmeti, pa kaldra se a fapa, bo zelo, ki te per langu smeti in gača, bo ni zdjebil. Škaj musova žela bo. No, te še te resir, ko ne danjevamo v fabu, ne še te resir misli. Ko ne res ne skabo, ne bo se ne skabo, pa te neko, ne, ko so jo in to trko žela. Jaz ste už jedo, tu zmatizalo, tak žiti v balde iz to... No, a še te jotek zelo, ko je neko ne torejo, pa ga je bo, ko si, ki neko v krakolini palta, te kure, ki jo kje, ki je na v krakolini spanta, še ta, bo zato pa zelo odštivel, pa se kuri v gezdi. Kaj bi ba tu bo prijeljita, ko bi bo bejtel se teš, vjeno špejemel te, pa ste bejo in aktivirilo, a te nisem. Kaj se si bilo? V očevi ni to, toliko zmalo to odporilo. O te koga bo kot sovrsta bati? Sovrsta Kaledurin. Kaledurin je, ne toliko Kaledurin, ne toliko bo, tako kaj posej še to kam bo, jaz mu kot ne rašili jav, pa si jaz je to posel še doma, pa si ima toliko zgore, da ne so, da ne zom, če ni ima toliko znači. Pa si žurejo, kot je v nerke, pa si šel te, a dve je bojra, te mišljene. Kaj je ne vsake, kaj te ne? Vsake te dva, kaj je ne? Tako če na to obe živi. Pa je nekaj? Vse da ne, nije. No, a te žive vse, kaj torej to vtrela, da si že dvu, da so... Da te torej, so se deja, da te odpravi, pa jih boste nuo gosti šrengi, ko si, ker to si... In tukaj to snuo bo se v vino, kako pa bo tesnejši in gdje to si kaj. Dan te se še mi ne jim daš, dan ti je ono se pri kao besedje. No se pri pa dan te? Jo, te. A te bo kaj mu dan te mu se pri? Te, jo. Ni že navnja vzange, mu kev, kaj pa živi v dostaj, te je ženo, ker pa sto kaj moter, sto kaj bi živimo. No se pri kao. Te kot ali se ti za bo pasi? Hrče. Čest. First time we saw that, yeah. First time we saw that video in Congress, we just couldn't believe uh, what had happened. What uh, I mean, the image uh, just pointing to the two. The, notice how particular her knowledge was of the people who lived uh, in her neighborhood. Um, neighbors, uh, looting from neighbors, uh, astonishing. Bystander, accomplice, willing uh, enabler. Uh, these are difficult concepts for sure. It's, um, again, you know, when we talk about problematizing the show, uh, we see, because a lot of times, uh, even students coming in and others say, well, it's the Nazis that did it, right? You know, that's sort of this all generalized thing, or Hitler did it, you know. You know well, you know, obviously, uh, thousands of people were involved as perpetrators, never mind as victims. And when we get into this sort of detail, I think students begin to understand, as we do, how complex this uh, whole phenomenon was. So as we drill deeper here, um, the, one of the many, uh, among the many other disconnects that students uh, discover as they, uh, as they study the show is that a, a perceived, uh, call it again disconnect or uh, rupture between memory and uh, confirmed fact. Um, and, and so we, since we use testimony a great deal in our course, we want students to try to get a handle on the importance of memory, uh, as opposed to perhaps scholarly historical interpretation after the fact. Uh, what happens when people remember uh, 50 years after the fact? How valuable is that information in a court of law, as it was indeed tested in a court of law? So we offer as Exhibit A a passage from James E. Young, who will be come speaking to us next, next month. Uh, that, uh, from an essay that really kind of looks very carefully at the interplay between testimony and historical scholarship. All of a sudden, I read from the essay, we saw four chimneys going up in flames exploding. The flames shot into the sky. People were running. It was unbelievable. That's a quotation uh, from a, a survivor account. Unbelievable indeed, reported the historians who watched the tape. Since only one chimney had been blown up, 
To their minds, such flawed testimony was as worthless to their inquiry into events as it was dangerous to historical truth. This is not James Young speaking. He's just relating the so-called scholarly perspective that we need that somehow to have scholars verify and confirm that there is X number of chimneys that were blown up. This becomes uh, this becomes the, the be all and end all of knowledge when it comes to what happened in, in Auschwitz. Um, Young, of course, has a very different point of view. Um, uh, as to our students, but again, it's important to note, well, is memory or survivor testimony somehow deemed irrelevant because some of the facts, so-called facts, were, don't jive with the reality of the situation? We have our students read a book called Neighbors that you mentioned, Ron, which talks about one half of a town going against another half and being them, massacring them. Uh, this event was, was buried, buried in a kind of conspiracy. Of, of, survive, of those who uh, were guilty. Like what this woman was talking about. Exactly. Um, and and uh, it's turned out that one person had witnessed and come forward and gave a deposition uh, just, just after the event, but he was not given credence for all kinds of reasons by the Soviets at the time during the beginnings of the Cold War. But it was one solitary voice. One solitary voice. Uh, and, you know, uh, Jan Gross, who's the author of Neighbors, said, maybe we've learned as historians and sociologists to listen to the solitary voice as well as the historians, and I think that's what uh, Young is trying to get at. We have student commentary on this particular passage that I think is so striking. It's one of the most poignant responses we had uh, that we've quoted in the book. Uh, it's an attempt to, I think what we've tried to get students to do is, is to kind of find some kind of integrative vision as they're looking at the, at the Shoah. Uh, in other words, uh, integrate the affective and the cognitive, trying to bring together the, me the methodology of history, the methodology of rhetoric and literary criticism. And, and I think this, go, this is the beginning, uh, this particular commentary is the beginning. This is from Richard, uh, dated March 2011. Reading this, that is a passage we just quoted from Young, reminded me of my foster sister, who had been raped on numerous occasions by her biological father. When she was a child, she told her family what daddy had done to her. But as she grew older and attempted to pull those horrid memories from deep within, the story she told the courts changed slightly from the one family members had remembered her telling. With the minor discrepancies in her and the family's testimony, the loathsome degenerate only received two years in prison for his crimes. The highly educated historians showed similar disregard to this poor woman's experience. Uh, Young goes on to say in, in the essay, and I think we talk about this in class, that uh, what was most important for that particular uh, survivor uh, who gave the after-the-fact account based on memory was that there had been a resistance at all, that a chimney had been blown up. Okay, perhaps not four, but that, that there was there's an affective component to memory and to historical uh, research, correct? Yeah. Um, and uh, I, think, I think Richard really understands that. But we've also, by the way, thought long and hard about the how should I, how should I put this? The, uh, the, the problematics of teaching the Shoah at a community college, where so many students are bringing very difficult narratives of trauma. And here's a case of that, that happening. To what extent are we assisting that student? Are they, in some ways, being hurt some more? I, I hope that, uh, in the end, uh, the community college is, in fact, uh, just the right place to be in Shoah and, and talking about something as difficult as the Shoah. I think I know our students have much to bring to the, uh, to the subject. Um, you know, in, uh, even though memory can be somewhat distorted, we've discovered that when uh, we brought survivors here, or even going to hear survivors or listen to them, they tend to be very detailed. In because uh, these things are in their long-term memory, you know, they haven't forgotten. Uh, they may have forgotten this piece or that piece. And I think historians, at least many historians, have come to appreciate that now that we may be in the beginning, as the story was being. Uh, told uh, by historians over the years, which really began in the, in the 1960s. Uh, actually, it took a while before this story began to really uh, uh, begin to uh, be researched in a real, real way. Anyway, the, the testimonies of survivors have been very important. I might also say that we can't be naive about survivor testimony. I've learned <coughs> over the years. In other words, many survivor testimonies are performances. I mean, we had a few years ago, remember time we had Stephen Ross here, who came in so an inmate camp uniform, hat, uniform, which he got from fighting space, did he not say that? Yeah. With some artifacts from the camps. He'd been to several, several camps. 
And I walked in, I said, what kind of a carnival was I into? As it turned out, it was a remarkably potent, uh, I wouldn't call it performance art necessarily, but he had indeed done his homework. The fact of the matter is that survivors who tell their testimony were in a very narrow corner at the time. They didn't see the big picture, they didn't have the aerial point of view. They didn't certainly have a hindsight to look at what Hitler and the Nazis were doing. So they do research. And then when they, when they offer their testimony, they, do, they offer it in a way that's at least the best testimony that I've seen, that is, I wouldn't say controlled, but, uh, but necessarily uh, it's, it's enacted. And this is where the rhetoric comes in, it's a construction. I remember vividly, we, we listened to one survivor, and we have had survivors come to a class, and we visited survivors in, in the Holocaust Museum in Rhode Island. And it was only at the very end where Rabbi Goldstein rolled up his sleeve to show his, his tattoo, only at the very end to get the maximum effect. I'm not, this is not to say, again, that uh, there was any untruthfulness of it, but simply we need to be uh, somewhat nuanced uh, readers and listeners to, to show a testimony. We can't, as Yehuda Bauer says, and I often quote, uh, you know, the study of the Shoah essentially, uh, we, without, the without the survivors, we would not be able to study the Shoah in so many words. Uh, in our book, we just end with some lessons for educators, and it's important to note, I won't go over all these, but I think as teachers of English and, and history, we need to be clear ourselves as to the methods we use, that we've been trained in. We need to know the limitations, uh, our own limitations. So I need to understand uh, my own limitations in terms of the historical context, uh, perhaps a matter of causation, and Ron needs to uh, acknowledge his limitations in terms of uh, how to critique a poem or looking at the genre knowledge, what it means to write a diary, what are the limits and conventions there. Uh, we need to be outright and clear about those things. I think at a community college, it becomes much more of a struggle because we don't see ourselves as disciplinary, specific, uh, or trained professionals. We see ourselves as something called generalists. But we've all come out of a particular discipline, a subject area. It may have been a while ago, but we all, we all come out of those areas. We also want to make certain that these students emerge from our classes whole and not fragment, not doubtful, not without faith. In fact, our last chapter in the book is, is called Reclaiming Faith, and I think that's an important part of what we intend to do in this class. And above all, I think we need to get out more. <coughs> it's, it's great, fantastic, for all kinds of reasons that Ron and I have been able to be in the same classroom together, and I've been able to read historical works that he's pointed out to me, and, and it's gone the other way as well. Um, yeah, I think you know, there are uh, Holocaust classes, show classes throughout the uh, country. Different places, you must Dartmouth actually have one and others. There's very few that we've seen in which uh, you integrate two disciplines. And uh, that's really one of the reasons we wrote the book, as an example of what can be learned by doing that kind of thing. Um, again, there's limits to what we can accomplish in one semester, but we think we make some advances both for our students, but also for ourselves, too, because this has been a journey. You know, it's not like uh, every time we teach it, we learn more. I think, whatever, however you envision learning. Yeah, it's a humbling experience, uh, for sure, for all kinds of reasons, both personal and professional. So you may have some questions. Um, I love this, uh, this set of panels from Art Spiegelman. Why comics? Why mice? Why the Holocaust? Yikes! Uh, <laughs> mouse is a really crucial part of our course. Uh, if you haven't read Mouse, the complete mouse, please do so. It's, it just brings all the threads of uh, of our course together, and it offers uh, a, a, a kind of a fresh, and uh, still after all these years, iconoclastic view of the Shoah. Um, it blurs genres and does all kinds of interesting things. Um, as as Al said, I, I, I love this quote, it, it isn't easy to live always under a question mark, but who says that the essential question has an answer? The essence of man is to be a question, and the essence of the question is to be without an answer. And yet, we are here studying the Shoah at Bristol, and we do the best we can to provide our students with a whole and sustaining vision of this terribly dark time. Um, we hope that students leave our class not, well, yes, with more questions, with more questions. And maybe the beginnings of answers, uh, knowing full how complex uh, this, this uh, event uh, was. So this might be a good time to ask. Yeah, questions. definitely. Any uh, comments or questions out there? Heard all the jokes. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it, it, was, Show a joke. it was a fascinating, fascinating 
life-changing um, period for me, and, and I got so much out of it. So I thank you. But one of the things that that I um, that struck me is with um, Regina, who was speaking, and the fact that you were talking about um, the the kind of comparison, the parallels between what Regina was saying and what Richard had said, um, the student, when he talked about his foster sister being um, raped by his biological father. There's this idea of um, that it's, it's so shameful what the witnesses saw, the witnesses of the Holocaust as well, it's so shameful that people have like tried to forget it and change the story mm -hmm. because it was such a taboo, shameful subject. So it really struck me the similarities between um, deniers of um, uh, incest, family incest, and the deniers of something like this because it's so unbelievable and nobody wants to own such a horrible thing. And I hadn't really thought of it in those terms, but um, Richard's uh, journal entry was really, really interesting. So I just wanted to make that comment. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Other questions? Other questions? Sure. I, I'm wondering if after after your students uh, write and, and look at these things, if after the course, if any of them are moved in another way, not only internally, but externally to take any kind of action or to engage in any kind of social justice issues or anything of, of that nature. Um, Many students over the years have said that they, at the very least, want to make sure that if they hear any types of uh, denying you know, remarks or even anti-Semitic remarks or even racist remarks, that they will respond rather than holding back. So at that, at that level, um, whether they, there's students, we sort of lose track, unfortunately, or students of whether they actually engaged in in direct social action work. I don't know of any right off the bat, but uh, I would hope so. Uh, As I said before, we, we often hope, we express the hope that these students will become witnesses themselves and, and uh, correct any misconception or prejudices that they might be aware of that are being expressed. But we talk about this in the book. It would be convenient for us to say that one of the learning outcomes of this course is a more ethical person, but we have no way of producing that evidence what we can do is, is control the best we can the parameters of the classroom, have certain objectives in mind, uh, be able to measure certain outcomes as well. Uh, Richard's uh, and the other students' responses in writing and in class offer us hope uh, that, we, that we see some changes in perspective and so we see a complex response to difficult subjects. Uh, so we have to settle for that for now. But we're hopeful that more can come out of it. Yeah, I mean, I think we mentioned, we do mention this in the book, that one of the purposes of teaching, especially in the humanities or social sciences, uh, is to, uh, the students go through some sort of transformative uh, way of thinking, you know, uh, some enhanced understanding of the world themselves. And certainly a course like this can do that, as a number of other courses here try to do. Any other questions? Yeah. Oh, just a comment. I think a whole lot of bystanders role of the bystander because too often I think that gets lost like we think of the perpetrator and we think of the victim and I know in public health there's a whole movement around bystander intervention around certainly domestic violence and sexual assault so I just really appreciate I think this is maybe the first presentation I've seen on the Holocaust that really talks about the role of bystander I think it's really unique and I think it's very timely because bystander Intervention is becoming a big uh, model in public health. So, oh, that's very interesting. Marcia, it's, you know, a neighbor is one of the many interesting questions that Jan Gross raises: is can uh, perpetrators be victims mm -hmm. as well? Um, and boy, that's, that that kind of uh, opens up all kinds of uh, discussion in class. There are no easy, right. uh, easy, convenient definitions of these terms. If, okay. Question. All right. It, it sounds like, um, from Richard's t uh, testimony about, about his foster sister, 
that it's, uh, it's probably pretty common to have uh, traumatic experiences brought to the surface by the material that you present. And um, so I actually find it very scary that we don't have a psychologist involved you do. available you do as well. to um, help students through these real traumas. Uh, we we have in the past had uh, people working with us, and we did certainly have a counseling center at the college. And we're very after the, maybe the first time we taught it, we were, became really cognizant of that possibility. So we try to uh, build that in to the extent to have students give us feedback on how they're experiencing this, and uh, try to either individually or as a class, and then do the any necessary interventions. Fortunately, some students have dropped out of the course uh, early on because of that, and that would make sense. Other than that, we haven't had any experience that, as far as we know, that has been, um, you know, dramatic, the traumatic. Uh, but we take what you say. Just a related point, we, we, I think we read about it, we make it, made a point from the beginning not to show any films of, um, of trauma. So it's all mediated, it's all through witness testimony. We feel that that's really important. We do not want to, as we say, victimize the victims further. Um, but even so, the, the literature offers uh, uh, graphic detail of, of trauma indeed. Any other questions Jean. before we get out? Jean? Um, on that <coughs> subject, my office door is right outside. I'm, I'm really primely situated. I'm outside the men's room and the ladies' room on the second floor of <laughs> building. <laughs> And often when I work late, I see students from your class at the Honors Center taking a break. And I, I have seen students crying during the break. But I also see other students supporting them. And yes. I think that's one of the good things about a seminar-style um, uh, experience like this, is that the, the students who feel that they have the strength and the courage to face uh, such things head on and to think about such things are, are often there for each other in the best sense of the word, not in the she was there for him kind of you know empty rhetoric, uh -huh. but it, it, in the sense that if you've ever been through a traumatic experience yourselves, and I, I say this to everyone here, then you know that if you've got support, there are times where the person who is with you is going through it and you're supporting that person. And there are times when you're going through it and that person is supporting you. And it, I seem to see a lot of that it, within yeah. the class. Yeah, at the end, we, I, I felt, and maybe you've seen it, Tom, when you come to our last class, the last class we, we have a pizza dinner and uh, we have um, salad and stuff, and, and all uh, people are sharing their, their culminating projects, usually the di in a digital format, and, and my sense is that this is a class that has earned its, its, uh, its bonding and its community. Mm -hmm. They really do come together in, in supportive ways. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. I think uh, we're about the end of our time. Eh? Thank you all for coming. Thank you.